Sherman, and wanted to do a real quick segment. Was on my Facebook, one of my Facebook groups, and had a question from Brian Burge. I think Brian's up in uh, Germantown or Gaithersburg, Maryland. But he was asked the question, hey, who out there is raising private money? And I responded to the question, and suddenly I realized, you know, getting a lot of people asking this question. I've gotten a lot of folks at www.askarealinvestor.com who are asking questions related to how do you raise private money? How do you get money for deals? And I thought I'd take just a quick five, six minutes to explain the do's and don'ts of raising money. Now listen, there's a lot of stuff in the real estate space and the real estate business that some people would say is you know black, white, gray. You know, like creative financing and creative deal making, that kind of stuff. Um, the bottom line is when it comes to raising money, it's either black or it's white. And you definitely want to stay away from the gray and you definitely want to stay away from the dark side. So real quick about my background, uh, I got my real estate license, as many of you guys know, uh, back when I was a student at Towson University back in 1983. So I've been at this business for 34 years. And then, of course, I went on to the Wharton School of Business, got my MBA in real estate finance. And I've been involved in real estate finance and financing projects for the last 32 years. I've done everything from little uh, uh, two-bedroom bungalows that I financed out of my own self-directed IRA, all the way up to $150 million uh, um, uh, sales of, of, of land to billion dollar, arranging the financing for billion dollar projects. And of course, um, the thing I'm most proud of is the fact that I was employee number two in the development of a project called Lansdowne out in Loudoun County, Virginia. And I was the chief financial officer for that project where I helped raise over $500 million to get that project off the ground and up and running. So. I know a whole bunch about real estate finance from very big projects to very small projects. Personally, personally, I have been responsible for raising about $2 million over the past couple years uh, of personal, private, you know, really individuals writing out checks. And then, of course, I match that up with bank loans and other kinds of financing. So in my own personal deal making, I've done at least $20, $30 million worth of deals. So here's the deal. When you are out there and you are raising money, whether you're brand new to the game or you've been at it a while, there's really sort of three buckets and three sort of, of frameworks or three approaches to raising money. So approach number one, which is real, which approach number one, which is usually where brand new investors find themselves, is in this area of doing something called a joint venture. Now, what's a joint venture? Well, when I was a kid growing up many, many years ago, back before I had all this gray hair, there was a very famous song that went something like this. The lyrics went something like this. You got a brand new pair of roller skates, I got a brand new key. Now for you youngsters out there who don't remember that song, way back in the old days, like the 1970s and the 1980s, when you bought a pair of roller skates, they actually fit over your shoes. And you had to adjust the skates. You had to adjust this, the length of the skate, and you had to adjust this little, um, sort of like this little catch thing that would catch onto your toes. And if you did not have the roller skate key, the roller skates were basically useless. So the song goes, you got a brand new pair of roller skates, I got a brand new key, you got something that I've been looking for and I got something that you need. So in the same vantage point, in the same vein, new investors who are first getting started and they're trying to put deals together and they need some money. They need some money either to do a fix and flip or they need some money to do a buy and hold and they're brand new to the game. Usually the place where they start is something called a joint venture. Now joint venturing is a, is a, is a fancy legal term for basically partnering. And you can joint venture, and you don't need to do any kind of fancy documents, but you do need some kind of documents. But you could basically have like a memorandum of understanding. Let's say, for example, two people meet at a local RIA. I know you can't see my handwriting, but it says RIA, right? Real Estate Investor Association. And one person says, hey, I found a deal. Another person says, hey, I would like to do some deals over there. And they say, well, you know, I need some money to do the deal. And the other person says, well, I got some money, OK? So you get together, right? And you basically form a partnership. That is, in the legal sense, a joint venture. Now, you can joint venture with just about anybody that you choose. I strongly recommend that you joint venture with people that you have some inkling that they're going to be honest and ethical and that kind of stuff, but you can joint venture with just about anybody that you want to, to joint venture with. The key is both parties have sort of an equal say in how the deal is going to go down. So in other words, if I'm out there and I am uh, partnering with people because I know how to make deals and they got money, or they got money, or I got money, and somebody else knows how to make deals, we both have sort of an equal say in how the deal is going to go down. Now, 
in the case of a joint venture, one partner may have a sort of super majority say. So example, if I'm writing a big check and you're sort of new to the game, I might say, well, tell you what, I'll partner with you, but I have veto power over any decisions that we make. But at the end of the day, there's an equal sharing and there's sort of an equal and an, an equitable or sort of an equal way of both participants agreeing to go ahead and move forward and some kind of an equitable way or an equal way that folks can decide, okay, this is not working out, we're gonna break up, or how we split profits, whatever. But both parties get to have a say in what happens. That's a joint venture. Now, many investors, after they get going and they need some money, they go on to the next step or the next bucket. So what's the next bucket? The next bucket is basically loans or lending. Right, so we all know about hard money lenders, right? But you know you can actually bring in private investors, or in this case, uh, private lenders, who can basically put up money in the form of a loan, either to replace the hard money lender, or in some cases, supplement. Because not every hard money lender will give you 100% of what you need for acquisition and 100% of what you need for fix up. So let's say you get out there and you find a deal, you need about $200,000 to pull it off, but when you finish it, the deal's gonna be worth about 250, 280, right? Hard money lender says, listen, I'll give you 180,000, but you still gotta to come to the table with 20. Well, you could bring in a private lender to close that gap. But what you would do is have one investor, one deal, and you would structure the deal, again, in the form of a loan. You could also do a joint venture. So in other words, you say, hey, listen, I find the deal, you bring the money, we're still gonna go get a hard money lender, and the hard money lender's gonna write a check, but you also, as my partner, are gonna write a check. But in either case, whether it's a joint venture, meaning you guys are partners, or you're bringing somebody into the deal, and again, it's sort of one investor, one deal, that person, that investor, has some say in what happens. So in other words, if I'm a private lender, and I'm loaning you the money to do the deal, I'll dictate the terms. I'll say, okay, listen, I'll loan you the money, but I wanna get 10% rate of return, and I wanna get paid back, and you structure this deal in the form of a loan. And again, you could always bring in, assuming that you find somebody who's got enough money, and it's one person who has enough money, you could always structure it so that the one person basically puts up all the money, and you may not even need a private, uh, you may not even need excuse me, a hard money lender, okay? Now, here's where things get a little tricky. If you bring somebody into a deal who's put money up, and oftentimes the trigger is more than one person, and you're now getting into the concept of pooling people's money. So example, let's say I meet this guy at the local RIA meeting, and he agrees to put some money up into my deal, and I say, great, and on the first deal, we're, we're basically JV partners, but then I get over here, and I said, well listen, for my next deal, I need twice as much money as you have. And he says, no problem, I can bring my cousin in, right? But now the cousin's coming in and he's coming in and everybody's standing around looking at me and saying, well, you're the deal maker, you make this thing happen, we will give you the money, but we're gonna basically make the money off of what you do. And I structure the deal in such a way that I am really sort of in complete control and they have to rely upon me to make the deal work. Well, that's not a joint venture, because there's not an equal sharing of decision making. And in this case, it may or may not be a loan, but here's the deal, you're bringing another person to the table. What you are now getting into is category number three, which is basically, you're putting together a syndication. And a syndication is any time that you are basically pooling other people's money. There's a very famous law case out there, it's called the Howry test, okay? And the Howry test has four parts. The first part is, is this a money-making venture? Money -making venture? The second part is there, is there an anticipation of making a profit? In other words, somebody's giving me money because it's a money-making venture and there's an anticipation of profits. And then the third part of the test is, are they relying upon me and what I do to get their money back? Okay, so here's the deal. Anytime you get into an area where somebody is giving you money with the expectation that they're gonna make a profit and they expect to get the money back and they're solely relying upon you for making the decisions. Like in other words, you say, okay, I think we're gonna buy this house over here. What do you think? And I go, I don't know, you're the deal maker, right? So now they're relying upon you. You're getting into the syndication territory. And the part that almost always clearly triggers the fact that it's a syndication is the pooling of money, right? Rico and I were partners on one deal. Rico says, let's do that again. I say, hey, Rico, I need twice as much money. Rico says, no problem, I can bring my cousin, uh, Eddie, in. Okay, Rico and Eddie now come in. I'm now pooling their money. And, it's a and more than likely, it's a syndication. Here's the deal. 
Syndications require registration. You have to register, and you register at the state level. If you cross state lines, then you would, of course, register at the federal level. And typically, most investors who are doing real estate deals are either doing what's called Regulation D or Regulation A offerings. You may also hear people talking about crowdfunding or PPM. All of this stuff, when you start hearing terms like crowdfunding and private placement memorandums and Reg D 504, 505, 506, or Reg A, you're now entering the world of the more sophisticated investor and the more sophisticated financing structure, and you now need to register that offering as a security. So anytime you get to the point where it's not you and a buddy making decisions jointly, where it's not you structuring a loan and then basically say you've got a loan and a mortgage document and you're basically saying to folks, okay, this is definitely a mortgage and it's you, one investor, one deal. Anytime you start moving into pooling money, ding, 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 a little thing ought to go off in the back of your head saying this looks and smells and feels like it's a syndication. And that's the time that you want to start talking to syndication or securities attorneys, okay? Because if you put together a syndication, no matter what you call it, right, you can call it anything you want, but if it falls under these guidelines, it's a syndication. You start doing a syndication and you haven't registered it, um, you run the risk of getting into some big time trouble. So irrespective of whether you're doing a joint venture or you're structuring a loan or you're doing a syndication, I have seven simple rules that I think will help keep you out of trouble. Now, before we go over these rules, and I probably should have said it at the outset, even though I went to law school, I am not an attorney and I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm giving you advice as somebody who's been in this business for 34 years, who's got a CCIM designation, a Wharton MBA, and spent the better part of the last 30 some years structuring the finance on deals, including my own personal deals, and I'm giving you business advice. So these are my seven simple rules for raising money, help keep you out of trouble. Number one, you ready? Don't lose investors' money. <laughs> don't lose investors' money, no matter what you do. I don't care if the whole deal goes to hell in a handbasket. You need to be prepared to make sure that your investors are made whole. Okay? I'm not talking about, well, hey, you promised them that you were going to basically you know, borrow 100000 and pay them a 10% rate of return, and you can't give them the 10%. You make sure you don't lose the 100000 Okay? And if you do, you better figure out a way that you're going to somehow make them whole. Number two, don't forget rule number one. Okay? Reputations are very short in this business, or excuse me, rep reputations are very long in this business. You lose investors' money, everybody's gonna know about it around town, okay? Which brings me to another point. Don't ever accept money unless you know what you're gonna do with it. it it's fine and dandy and it's fine and all good to be talking to people about what you're doing as an investor and strategizing and talking about it, but at the point in time you're actually ready to receive money, you better have a very clear idea as to what you're gonna do with it and more importantly, how are you gonna get it back along with a piece of the profits or some kind of interest payment. All right, R rule number three, focus on doing good deals. Look, there's nothing wrong with using uh, a hard money lenders and traditional lenders and people who are in the business of lending and loaning as you're putting your deal making chops, your deal making skills together. As you get better at making deals, then you can begin to sort of move away from that more expensive money into private money. And, and I understand is the reason, number one reason why most people want to bring in private investors, quite honestly, is because you pay a lot less out. Okay, and I get that. But hey, when you're first getting started, don't look at the hard money lender like he's the enemy or she's the enemy. They actually really are your friend when you first get started, okay? So you wanna focus really at the outset, not so much on raising money, but focus on doing good deals and learning how to put together good deals. Next, know the regs, right? Know the rules, know the regulations. And if you don't know the rules or regulations, like, like I said, I went to law school to help to learn some of this stuff. I got an MBA, you don't have to do that stuff. If you don't know the regs or the, reg the, the regulations, then know the experts who do. Make sure that you are making a conscious effort, a conscious plan to get to know the people who understand how this stuff works so that they can give you the best advice and keep you out of trouble and keep you on the path of making money, okay? Next, make sure that whatever you do, and I don't care whether it's a joint venture, a loan, or a syndication, make sure you disclose everything in writing. Okay? If you had a bankruptcy, you better tell somebody that. You know, you don't have to tell them that on the first meeting, but before money changes hands, you better tell them that. If you went to jail for embezzlement, you better tell them that. Because guess what? We live in the information age. Privacy is, is, is long gone. If there's something out there in your past history, guess what? People will find it out. And they'll find out about it at the worst possible time. If you have something out there and it was a problem, disclose it. 
because if you disclose it and somebody still gives you the money, you're cool. But if you don't disclose it and then they later on find out and there's an issue, guess what? You're going to be in serious trouble, okay? So make sure when the time comes where you're ready to receive the money that you have written documents. And I don't care whether it's a joint venture agreement, I don't care if it's loan documents, or I don't care if it's a private placement memorandum. Make sure you got stuff in writing and make sure in the stuff that you have in writing there's some kind of disclosure of you know, what your experience has been and if there's been any kind of boo-boos that are pub of the public record, make sure you disclose that. Also, make sure to disclose what you're gonna do with the money. And whatever you say you're gonna do with the money, number six, do what you say. So if you say, you know, look, I'm gonna take some of the money and I'm gonna wind up taking some classes and paying for some experts because I'm new at this, put it in the document, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you disclose it and the person says, sure, I'll give you the money and I don't mind you going ahead and taking some classes or doing this and that, or maybe you, you, know, you wanna give yourself the latitude to borrow some money from that fund. Fine, but you better disclose it. I'm not saying that it's legal because it's not always legal and that's why you wanna talk to experts at the time you're putting your deal together. But generally speaking, as long as you, as long as you disclose in writing what you're gonna do with the person's money before you get the money, you're gonna be okay. But you can't you know, get the money and you didn't disclose it and then all of a sudden, oops, I got a tax bill, I'm gonna borrow a little money over here to pay my tax bill and that's okay, I'll sneak it back in. No, you can't do that. Whatever you're going to do, disclose it in writing, and then whatever you disclose in writing, and whatever you say you're going to do with the money, make sure that's what you do. And then, of course, number seven, have a system. You need to have a system for raising money. You need to have a system for putting together joint ventures. If you're going to do the sort of one investor, one deal, and create mortgages, you need to have a system to do that. So let me give you a couple of resources if you're interested. Every spring, I teach a 90-day class on how to raise money. It is based on my award-winning course called Unlimited Capital, but it's a live class. And if you've ever seen my Unlimited Capital course, it comes in two binders. Part one talks about how to raise money when you're just getting started, all the way up through single family house deals and single family house rehabs. Part two takes off on that and talks about how to raise money to do commercial deals, okay? So, 90 day class, first 30 days we focus on getting started all the way up through getting like a million dollar line of credit to be a rehabber. The next uh, 60 day, excuse me, next 30 days, we talk about how to raise money to do uh, commercial deals. And then the last 30 days, I actually have my students in the class actually build private investor presentations, and then they come before the rest of the class and we critique them. Uh, having a private investor presentation is a huge part of your, of, your, of your toolbox for raising money. So we want to make sure that you get lots of practice and you get it down perfect, well, I shouldn't say perfect, get it down well before you get out there and actually start raising money. So it's a 90-day live class, hands-on, lots of interaction. Secondly, is if you're like, well, Sherman, I can't wait around till the spring to take a class, or hey, just give me the information and I can do this on my own, you can still get the Unlimited Capital course, unlimitedcapital.com, and that's capital with two A's, unlimitedcapital.com, and you can get the home study system, which you can use at your leisure, in addition to the two binders and the DVDs and the CDs, there's also access to online training, including specific instruction and specific information from my two uh, securities attorneys, Jillian Sidoti and Gene Trump. Bridge, um, who are the two leading experts in this field of raising money for real estate investors doing syndications. Also, some behind the scenes conversations with Ben Miller of Fundrise. Also, lots of behind the, converse, behind the scenes conversations with many of my advisors who helped me learn all this stuff all along the way. So those are your two resources. And as always, thanks for asking the questions. Brian, thanks for asking the question. Keep them coming. Just go to www.askarealinvestor.com. Talk to you soon.